Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander. And as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witz University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, typically when we talk about the Chinese in Africa, the focus is always on these loans for resources deals. And in fact, a lot of the the behavior of the Chinese in Africa um, is actually contrary to what a lot of people think, because there's this idea that China's buying up Africa and China's eating up all the resources. And earlier this year, there was a conference at the China Africa Research Initiative, which is the Johns Hopkins University uh, China Africa Study Center run by Professor Deborah Braudigam. And one of the things in her research that she found was that the Chinese investment behavior in Africa actually mirrors a lot of the IMF in terms of where uh, investment goes. And a lot of that investment and a lot of the loans that the Chinese are doing tend to follow resource-rich countries. So a lot of it's in places where there's oil, not not surprising, okay? But there are some exceptions to this, and and this is what's so fascinating because, you know, Kobus, you and I always talk about how the China-Africa story can really be anything you want it to be. And I think our discussion today of what the Chinese in Rwanda highlights the complexity and the diversity because in many ways what's happening in Rwanda completely contradicts that narrative that I talked about at the very beginning about the Chinese ch- chasing resources. Yes, because Rwanda has very little natural resources. It's a very, it's a small, very densely populated country with not, you know, a lot of minerals, um, not a lot of space, not a lot of forests left now. Um, yet there's a ton of Chinese involvement and in Chinese involvement in a lot of different sectors at the same time. So let's get an insider's view on what the Chinese are doing in Rwanda. And we're joined once again on the show by Lily Guo. Lily is, if for those of you who follow China Africa, you will know exactly who she is. She's the Africa okay. correspondent for the online financial magazine or website uh, Quartz. QZ.com is their website. Lily has been writing from Hong Kong, and now she's based in Nairobi. And she recently did uh, a, an expedition to Rwanda, where she's just completed a series of articles. Welcome back to the show, Lily. Thanks, Eric. Lily, you uh, titled one of your articles, Rwanda is a landlocked country with few natural resources. So why is China investing in it so heavily? I, I think that's a great place for us to start. What is the appeal of this country of 11.2 million people, so it's tiny. Uh, the per capita income there is $1,784. It's not rich. It's got a GDP of just $20 billion, which probably makes it less than the GDP of Shanghai. Um, what's the appeal if, if the numbers don't really back up why they're there? I think one of the reasons why the Chinese are in Rwanda is because it is a good kind of testing ground for other places that they might want to go in Africa. So a lot of people talk about a lot. So I would ask everybody, every sort of Chinese entrepreneur that I met there, you know, what's the appeal of Rwanda? Why here? Why not Kenya? Why not, you know, wherever? And they would always say things like the stability, um, the government, the sort of um, uh, pro-investment friendly government policies, you know, things like starting a business takes less than 24 hours, um, tax breaks. And, uh, you know, and also I think probably maybe the most important thing that they said is the relative lack of corruption in the government compared to other places that they would go. Let's talk about the um, government. Yeah, very, that, let me just quickly just talk about the government. The government's very interesting because it was it's the government under the president, presidency of Paul Kagame. And Paul Kagame was the, you know, for those of you who are not familiar in kind of modern Rwandan history, uh, he was the former military leader who kind of defeated the Hutus. Uh, so he's a Tutsi. He overthrew the Hutus who were responsible for the the massacre in 1995, if I'm correct. 1995, 1996, is that correct? Um and he has basically modeled himself in many ways on Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, and even in some ways the Chinese, where he's been focusing on political, on civil, I'm sorry, on social and economic development at the expense of political rights and whatnot. Am I correct there? I th- yes, that that is the point that I made in the story, which was it's interesting. Um, the <laughs> one of Kagame's advisors tweeted the story and tweeted, um, you know, that you know like kind of credit for actually coming to Rwanda to report the story, but you kind of lost me at this idea of China as a model um, and the, and the, and the debate over whether or not China is this sort of colonial power uh, for this country. 
Um, but I do think, I mean, but it is the case that Rwanda has looked at, I mean, maybe they're not emulating China exactly. Um, I mean, of course, I mean, you can't really do that, but they have taken Singapore and China and, and South Korea um, and so the sort of East Asian miracle countries as as models for their development. So the Chinese uh, entrepreneurs that you spoke with, what what are they mostly doing there? Um, you know, kind of, and and are they concentrating on Rwanda or are they trying to do uh, regional expansion? The um, most of them were focused on Rwanda. They're mostly doing small things. So I talked to a woman who runs a, a garment factory. Um, I don't think that story's come out yet. That's the next one. But so she runs a garment factory in the Kigali Special Economic Zone. She used to, she had worked in Ethiopia and running a government factory there. And she had ha- run a cell phone manufacturing company or factory in Kenya, but that had closed. So but her focus right now is, is Rwanda, but she would like to expand. Um, and then another guy I spoke with was, uh, he has a car, you know, import business, um, kind of like uh, equipment, um, construction equipment and things like that. But and I think he was focused on just Rwanda. But I guess what I noticed about these guys is that they're, um, they, they, they weren't that ambitious. You know, they weren't trying to, they just wanted to come here. They felt like, you know, it's not this huge market, but there's enough, there is demand and there is an opportunity and they can have a little slice and that's enough and they can have a good life and, you know. And just sort of so live here. That reveals a little bit about the type of Chinese migrant that's there. So as opposed to the big state-owned enterprises, which are very active in places like Angola, South Africa, even the Sudans, Kenya, um, producing big infrastructure projects like the Standard Gauge Railway. It sounds like in Rwanda, we're talking a lot more small to medium-sized independent Chinese entrepreneurs who are migrating there. Well, for the private investment, that's the case. I mean, the big state-owned companies are in Rwanda building buildings and roads and um, agriculture infrastructure. So I visited a um, a water a watering system. They, um, I think, Sina Hydro had also built a really big irrigation system. So they're winning the bids for that. But what I thought was interesting in Rwanda is just that. I mean, I mean, there's always that assumption that okay, China builds infrastructure in exchange for resources. But in these cases, and something that the Rwandan bureaucrats kept stressing to me is that these Chinese companies they won the bids for these contracts. They're not. This isn't some sort of deal. This isn't some sort of charity. This isn't. You know. Um, this is just business. So they are there. Um, what is their relationship with the Rwandan uh, community? Are you know kind of are they working together effectively, or is there friction? Um, I think that that ver- I mean I'm sure that that varies. But there there was one anecdote that I tried to include in this last story, the headline that you mentioned, Eric, which was when I went to visit this um, this rice paddy that was being built in southern Rwanda in this area called Gashora. I mean, pretty much as soon as I got there, the um, the Chinese staff for the company building it were talking to me in Chinese and complaining about the Rwandese and working with them and how, um, you know, they the um, you know their the material that they were importing in would be held up at customs unless they paid a bribe. Um, that the that the Rwandese were skimping on things and so the structure of it wasn't actually any good and they thought that it was just going to fall apart in a couple of years anyway. Um, but then as soon as they walked away, the Rwandese side of it, the Rwandese guys were complaining to me in English and saying, like, ask the workers if they have water, they have to bring their own equipment, the Chinese aren't, you know, meeting environmental standards. And it was just this interesting, um, I mean, they and, and I think both sides knew that the other was talking about them, too. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I guess it was kind of obvious, but I just, I found that really interesting. Um, I also went to a, um, in northern Rwanda, um, closer to anyway, so the, the, the livestock watering system that I just mentioned. So um, I think it had been built in, it had finished being constructed in September and uh, just a few months afterwards, the farmers were saying how the taps were broken and, you know, the water wasn't coming out or it was coming out all at once. Um, and, you know, they, and they were really critical of the Chinese and sort of um, looking back on the experience of the Chinese, there, they would say like, oh, well, they, when they were building things, they put up these kind of like tents, so you couldn't see what they're building, and that's because they were um, they were doing something shady. They were using bad materials or whatever. Um, and then I did talk to the Chinese company that was Sina Hydro and asked them about you know what like what's the deal with this, and they said that well, I mean they like all of them. They were saying that all the material was imported from Europe. It had gone through several checks, so if there's any kind of failure in 
the quality of it should be on the Rwandese. Um, and that, you know, that when they were during the process of building the project that um, the locals like were kind, of, were kind of breaking the taps and that material was being stolen and stuff. So I did, I did see definitely some that things don't always go so smoothly. Yeah, and I, I guess that's what we see elsewhere in Africa as well. And I, I kind of yeah. all put this as part of the growing pains of this relationship that we're still very, very early on in this dynamic where the two sides don't really know how to talk to each other productively all the time. Uh, and that sounds like what, what we're seeing here. Um, I remember when I, was, when I was living in the DRC and I crossed over from Eastern DRC into Congo, into Rwanda, and the thing that I noticed the most was, you know, the DRC, the roads are just, you know, non-existent and they're terrible. And as soon as you get to that boundary, boy, these perfect, beautiful roads. I mean, in Rwanda, it was just amazing how the infrastructure has been so developed. And I would ask people, I'd say, how is it possible that Rwanda has been able to build so much? And, and they said that Paul Kagame was brilliant at leveraging guilt for the inaction of the West during the... The massacres and during the genocide. And in fact, President Bill Clinton has said that that was his biggest regret of his whole presidency was not intervening. And as a result, the Clinton Foundation uh, and, and countless other European and American charities and governments have given billions of dollars. So money is very much the kind of the, the currency, if you will, for the West in Rwanda. I was interested reading about what you were talking about, these agricultural technology demonstration centers that are run by the Chinese. And they're very practical in their orientation. So they're teaching people how to grow, how to use kind of agricultural technology and, you know, farming techniques and whatnot. And you interviewed, um, uh, you know, the director of the China-Rwanda Agricultural Technology Demonstration Center, an individual by the name of Hu Yingping. And uh, mm -hmm. he or she, is she or he? He. he. He said this quote, which I thought was very interesting. Quote, Western countries donate money. This is what we do. Implying that <laughs> we're actually doing stuff as opposed to just giving money. Talk to us a little bit about that dynamic between how the Chinese see themselves in Rwanda and maybe how the Westerners see themselves. The Yeah, the I guess a lot of what the terms that they kept using, the, the Chinese officials involved with this project are agronomists. Um, was helping, like share. Actually, it was sharing. It was sharing China's experience, China's reforms in its agricultural sector with African countries, and helping them develop their own self-reliance. Um, and you know, as we talked more, it you know, because I had wondered about the mod the model of these um, of these centers, and you know, there's you know various debates about Chinese aid in Africa. You know, what is it? how is it different from Western aid? And it is and it is the case that with these centers that they, um, I mean, well, they're, they're administered by the Ministry of Commerce, which I think actually all Chinese aid is. Um, and, you know, the Ministry of Commerce, the remit is to promote Chinese businesses. And so I thought that was interesting. And the these centers, I mean, so they're funded by um, the Chinese government and whatever institution has bid to 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 do this project um, with like bid with the Chinese government to, to do it in an African country or whatever country. And um, and so after a few years, they're supposed to become self-reliant. They're supposed to become a kind of business. So the center in Rwanda, I think it's after five years, um, or they're behind schedule, but they're supposed to develop this joint venture with um, with the Rwandese um, kind of, uh, not the, I think it's with the Rwandese government, but it'll basically be a private venture and they are supposed to make money. So they're supposed to, um, they want to be this sort of processing center. So they will sell equipment, the material to Rwandese companies that will get involved in the mushroom industry. So their big thing is that they want to push this particular type of mushroom farming, which I think is one, good for food security in Rwanda, um, and two, good for agriculture because it prevents soil erosion. And three, this method was actually invented in this university in Fujian, um, and they're just looking to expand. So I guess I just wanted to explore the sort of like dual nature of Chinese aid or agricultural aid through these centers, which is both this sort of development focus, like nominally, and then also behind that, this, you know, business focus, which I think the Chinese would call win-win. Yeah, but was he right? It <laughs> was very interesting for me. Go, go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead. Just very quickly. Sorry, okay. Kobus. Was he right in saying that the Westerners give money and we actually do something more practical? Or are the Westerners also there doing things like what the Chinese are doing, but he just doesn't know about it? I think that is, I think it is kind of a, a more outdated view because I do think 
um, so I, I spoke with some people involved in like the World Food Program in Rwanda, and they were saying, I mean, they were pretty, um, pretty favorable toward the Chinese budget and saying, and they were saying like, yeah, there is definitely more of a focus now on blending, like bringing in the private sector in development because it does, um, it can help projects be more sustainable and um, uh, self-sustaining. What was very funny for me about about reading this was, you know, all of this works. It, it makes complete sense. It makes great ecological sense. You know, it's 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 a perfect thing to do. Except that Rwandese don't like mushrooms. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So yeah. This and work it, goes into trying to get them to eat mushrooms. Right. I mean, these they do cooking classes. I mean, I just thought it was so funny that one of so they train uh, Rwandese and kind of give them help to start their own businesses. And one woman. I mean, the mushrooms that she sells, they have instructions on the package of how to, like, what to do with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, and also, I mean, and there was a study that I mentioned in the story where um, these researchers had gone to a couple other countries, I think it was Tanzania and Zimbabwe, and in some of these cases, the the what the technology that was being promoted by these centers didn't always fit what actually suited that country. So promoting rice when maize is the staple food and a lot of people in that country can't provide or can't afford rice. I think that might have been Tanzania. Um, you know, so in some cases, these kind of those priorities don't work that well together. I'd like to kind of start to close out our discussion a little bit talking about the politics of the relationship. And it's a very interesting, you know, dynamic between the Kagame government and and Beijing. In in some ways, it reminds me a little bit of what's happening in South Africa, where the Zuma administration in South Africa is very much, or the ANC, I'll say, actually, the party in South Africa has fully embraced the Chinese model of a party-run state. You know, they're doing a Communist Party training school, uh, similar to what the Communist Party training school is in South Africa. And it seems like Paul Kagame and his government, uh, you know, is following a very similar kind of pursuit. You talked about how in your writing, how the the Rwandans have been sending over government officials to train in China, how there is a very similar type of human rights dynamic. Paul Kagame himself and his government have come under severe criticism over the years for their human rights record, you know, for, you know, attacking dissidents not only in Rwanda but outside of the country, uh, for silencing dissidents, for having unfair elections for not respecting, you know, basic human rights that are agreed upon by the United Nations. And in many ways, it does look and feel very similar as an economic model to what we see in places like China. And so, mm. you know, there's a darker side to this relationship. And I, I wonder if the two are getting closer. Does that just further enhance, you know, the Rwandan government's questionable decisions on human rights? I think it I think it has to enable it in some way. So if one of your major partners is a country that um, turns their you know turns you know turns the other way to those kinds of things and um, and and then also supports a sort of like the state is always right um, and anything for the cost of stability, then I think that it does it does have an effect. And um, I guess one of the criticisms that I mentioned earlier from his, his advisor is the idea that. Rwanda is looking to China as some sort of model, and it, and I can see how that's condescending. But it maybe not China, maybe not not so much that China is a model, but China does set a precedent um, if they're such a big partner. And I did think it was interesting. One of so I interviewed um, a former Rwandan ambassador. He was the first ambassador to, to China after the genocide, and he said, um, and I just thought it was so fascinating. He said that when um, after the genocide, Paul Kagame went, he was then vice president. And those two sites that he wanted to see were industrial sites and historical sites. Um, and so it seemed pretty clear that he wanted to, I mean, he w they were learning from the Chinese example of like, what do you do with your history, a kind of um, chaotic history to overcome that and develop and industrialize. So it kind of does seem like there is an, ex an example being set. Kobus, after you read both of Lily's articles on the Chinese in Rwanda and listening to what she's been saying now in terms of both the optimism and the excitement of what's been going on there, but also the, this kind of more questionable political decisions that are being made, maybe, again, enabled, I think, is the, probably the right word. What's your kind of takeaway about the Sino-Rwandan relationship? You know, I, I'm probably uh, somewhat more optimistic about it than a lot of other people. So many problems in Africa come from the incredible wealth gap and the, the concentration of wealth in the hands of a, of a small elite. 
um, you know, so so it's very difficult to talk about human rights in Africa if you don't talk about the about poverty, um, and I think this is this is a massive problem that. Um, that you know that in Western discussions about Africa and, and Western age Africa is that is that the the simple fact that it's so it's so easy to have injustice if a small group of people control controls everything, um, you know that that's never really taken into account. And the, so the very fact that there is business being grown and you know kind of that there is a kind of a not only big Chinese companies, but smaller Chinese companies are getting involved. That all strikes me as, as potentially optimistic, even when it happens in a kind of an illiberal kind of environment like Agame. You know, kind of maybe I'm, I'm, I'm really going for the silver lining yeah. here. But, you know, if, if there is some form of development, that already helps, you know, kind of, but we do need to keep our eye on what, what form that development takes. So, Lily, you are one of the few, you know, correspondents in Africa who's dedicated or in part dedicated to covering China-Africa relations, and you've covered it longer now than most. Did your reporting in Rwanda change your view, positive or negative, uh, uh, or change the storyline that you've had in your mind about the Chinese in Africa in any way? Well, one thing I've been thinking a lot about is um, something that we've that I think in the China Africa media circles is discussed a lot is is uh, reports that get at these like sweeping narratives and like every every story is supposed to sort of tell us about the Chinese in Africa, and I've been thinking about that because um, so that whether or not that is so in journalism I mean for my editors I mean that is that that is what they want to know like what you know what's the point of this what's the point of this story and when i was doing this this the story on uh, looking to sort of at chinese businesses in rwanda i was kind of like after I, I wasn't even sure what the story was because i felt like i just met a bunch of chinese people in rwanda and they were all doing different things um and i think anyway so i think that that was just an example so finally thinking about the question okay what does this say and it just says it does just say that there is this diversity of chinese engagement in africa um, through individuals and government officials and um, state-owned enterprises. And I think that I kind of knew that intellectually just based on things that experts have said, but I hadn't gotten to see it firsthand. So in that way, it did inform my view. Yeah, I love that's the part of the story that I found the most exciting as well, is that, again, it complicates the China-Africa story that's already very complicated, but it really defies the simple black and white narratives that are so commonly held by, you know, a lot of people who are not as sophisticated uh, as you are certainly in covering the story. So excellent reporting. Thank you so much for, you know, the, the great stories. Two are already out. China is on a mission to modernize African farming and find new markets for its own companies. And another one, Rwanda is a landlocked country with few natural resources. So why is China investing so heavily in it? Lily, you said a third one is on its way. What was that? What's that one about? <laughs> So that one is about um, a Chinese government factory that is um, has started this training program with the running government to train locals in textiles and sort of the, the, the goal is to jumpstart a textile industry in Rwanda and, um, you know, and help like Rwandan manufacturing, which is generally the goal in a lot of African countries and this sort of promise of Chinese manufacturing moving to Africa. Um and, but it's also uh, connected to this movement in the East African community to ban secondhand clothing. So the, I guess this idea that if Rwanda um, starts manufacturing their own clothes, I mean, most of these clothes are for most of these garments are for export, but then that they could um, kind of move from that dependency on secondhand clothing. But it was, it's really fascinating because anyway, and so I can talk about it more next time. You'll be <laughs> able to find it over on Quartz and you can find Quartz at QZ.com. By the way, Quartz has the most badass app ever made by any company ever. Uh, it's a little chat. Oh, thank you. It's like a chat bot kind of cool type of at, so, app. So if you haven't gotten the Quartz app, I highly recommend it. You can also follow Lily on Twitter. Where's the best way on Twitter to follow your stories and find all these great reportings that you're doing? So on Twitter, I'm at L-I-L-K-U-O. Excellent. Quote. And uh, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, all the wonderful places with all the dots and Ws. Uh, you know, for Kobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk, 
or eric at eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.